David Randall, Director of Research of the National Association of Scholars, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the latest in our American Innovation webinar series, a series devoted to the history of American science and technology. Now, we have, I am delighted to say, three panelists for our discussion of the Manhattan Project, two of whom are here, and we're hoping the third one shows up soon. I'll just say what the guiding questions were for which we they're prepared to talk about. Uh, you know, the Manhattan Project, the name for America's atomic bomb program, was one of the most tightly kept secrets of the war. What is the story behind the secretive program? How was the atomic bomb developed? And how was it kept such a close secret? How has America's atomic program changed since the inception of the Manhattan Project? Now, we have three distinguished panelists. Uh, Ms. Cynthia Kelly is the founder and president of the Atomic Heritage Foundation. Before creating the foundation, she served for over 20 years as a senior executive with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection Agency. And more that I'm not going to say in her biography. Uh, not uh, immediately present, though I hope soon, uh, Dr. Tom Ramos, is a physicist and author of From Berkeley to Berlin, How the Rad Lab Helped Avert Nuclear War, and has been working for 40 years as a physicist at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Dr. Alex Wellerstein, present, is a hist historian of science and nuclear technology and a professor at the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey, uh, where he is the director of science and technology studies. He is also author of Restricted Data, the History of Nuclear Secrecy in the United States. And I will try to put in at least some book links into uh, the chat for everybody to take a look at. If I don't do that, somebody else here at NAS will. The way we do this, 12 to 14 minute, relatively conversational presentations by each of the speakers. Then uh, the remainder is guided question and answer and um uh discussion ideally prompted by you all everybody reading um uh here you put your questions into chat or q and a buttons at the bottom and then um uh i read it or it can be read directly by the speakers who can also talk to one another directly i i will mention all this is being recorded so it's, not, it's available for posterity. If you have to leave suddenly, don't worry. You'll be able to uh, um, read this all. Also, if your question doesn't get answered, uh, send it to me afterwards, randall at nas.org. I'll be delighted to forward a question on to the panelists so, so they can have the option of answering it. And I think that's all the happy business there needs to be. Um, uh, Ms. Kelly, would you be so kind as to go first? Sure, I'll be very happy to. Um, I'm just putting my stopwatch on. There we go. <laughs> so I stay within my allotted uh, 12 to 14 minutes. I thought I'd start by letting uh, people know how I got involved with the Manhattan Project, where I've spent over 25 years working on this. Um, no, my father didn't work on the Manhattan Project no relatives. Um, I was a history major, taught history for a few years before heading to Washington, D.C., where I got swept up working for Congress. And then, as uh, David mentioned, the EPA, and that segued to um, six years at the Department of Energy. And in that capacity, I learned that the department was going to take down all the Manhattan Project buildings related uh, that were on the property of the Los Alamos National Laboratory. So this was the heartbeat of the project. This was where the brain trust was. This is where Oppenheimer was and all his, his luminaries. Um, I asked, aren't you gonna save any? Uh, and the answer was, why should we? So I thought there was a good reason to. <laughs> this was a, a moment in time that was really important for the world and, and that there's nothing like having the authentic place where it happened. Um, and I was able to get the Advisory Council for Historic Preservation, which advises the president and Congress on uh, matters that have to do with uh, historic properties to spend a day at Los Alamos. 
And one of the participants, an architectural historian said, these buildings are monumental in their lack of monumentality. It's kind of a backhanded compliment, but in truth, the buildings were put up for the duration of the war. However long that might be, they were just like overgrown garages. It's kind of like the Silicon Valley story all over again, you know, starting off in a very humble place. They did this amazingly success, um, sophisticated stuff, uh, harnessing the energy of an atom. So anyway, that got me going. Um, as luck would have it, we were able to get a Save America's Treasures grant uh, that was uh, to commemorate the millennium by preserving federal properties that were in danger of being lost that were significant to our history. And the Los Alamos properties were chosen. And I, the challenge was that someone had to match the award, and there was a little over a million dollars that had to be raised to, um, you know, draw down the, the, the Save America's Treasures grant. So as a federal employee, you can't raise money on the side. That's not allowed. <laughs> but fortunately, I had enough years in and I could take an early out buyout. And I thought, eh, this is what I'll do for the next six months or a year. But it went on for 25 years. <laughs> it's been endlessly fascinating. I've had a wonderful time. I've worked closely with Alex Wellerstein, dragged him to a conference with the Japanese from Hiroshima and Nagasaki who were really worried about how is the United States going to interpret this history. Um, any rate, uh, it's been a wonderful time. Uh, I founded the nonprofit Atomic Heritage Foundation in the year 2000, or 2002, I guess, and then was able to convince um, the delegations in Congress, especially from New Mexico, Tennessee, and Washington State, this is worthy of a Manhattan Project National Historical Park. And we got legislation to direct the National Park Service to study whether in Indeed, this was a good addition to the park system. Study started in 2003 and 12 years later, we got the legislation passed. So there has been a park at three sites now for eight years. You can go and see some properties, not all of them, obviously. <laughs> there was a lot of money for cleanup and not so much money for preservation, but there are some remaining at all three sites and um, encourage you to go. But it, we also got involved in was trying to preserve the oral histories. And we partnered with journalists who had recorded their interviews. For example, Marty Sherwin, who um, you know, is now famous for having co-authored American Prometheus, the basis for the Oppenheimer movie. He has uh, allowed us to, to publish 70 interviews that he recorded you know, just on a, a, a recording device of just this oral, but they are wonderful with the principles, Hakan Chevrolet and, and all of the others that you saw in that movie. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, it's a great collection. It's another collection that uh, I found in the bowels of Boston University on three and a half speed tape um, that, have, that were recorded in 1965 and 66. So this is when the pantheon of the Manhattan Project were still alive. So the recordings include 12 hours of General Groves. So if you ever have a, a night where you can't sleep and you wanna hear what this man who is the dynamo behind the Manhattan Project says about it, uh, listen in. Uh, Oppenheimer was more succinct, 45 minutes of him, but his voice, his grandchildren tell me is the best likeness they've ever heard. So anyway, we have a treasure trove of these recordings some of which, like 250 of which were recorded previous to my getting involved, but that we digitized and put online and transcribed. And then we have 350 others of the young, younger set, <laughs> those that were, were taken out of line from the army because they had some chemistry or physics or mathematics and were put in what they called the special engineer detachment. So they were sent to help out as junior scientists or assistants, uh, the senior scientists at Oak Ridge and, and uh, Los Alamos primarily. And these are, are marvelous. Um, I wanna say there were three things that that's just wanna share that were transformative about how the Manhattan Project went about its science. 
And one was the interdisciplinary collaboration, which was really key. It was um, the first of a kind reactors, first of a kind um, bomb configurations. Every problem was um, very daunting and never before tackled. So you needed the best minds you could find to help. And Oppenheimer recognized that. He had had a formative experience when he was at University of California, Berkeley in the, in the 30s and worked closely with Ernest Lawrence who um, founded this approach of collaboration, which you know, in American science, in fact, I think in European science in the um, early part of the 20th century was unique. Most people worked in their cubicle. It wasn't a collaborative sport. Uh, so this was unusual to pull together different, different disciplines. The Germans had a far more structured hierarchical approach. Uh, the physicists looked down on everybody else, including the chemists, and they didn't bother to collaborate when they made their prototype reactor with graphite blocks. They didn't ask the chemists, what do you think of this? Uh, and consequently, their graphite blocks were contaminated with boron, which is a neutron capture. Uh, capturing element and uh, their reactor didn't work. And Rico Fermi didn't make that mistake. So on December 2nd, 1942, at the University of Chicago in the, in the squash courts under Stag Field, we had the first sustained reaction, nuclear reaction, because his graphite in collaboration with the chemists was pure. Anyway, just, just an example of how um, the contrast and, and why, why this uh, worked so well for the Manhattan Project. Um, so Oppenheimer insisted to Groves who wanted to compartmentalize everything that they had to have um, unfettered discussions. And he had a colloquia every week uh, with people, senior people in the project. Obviously um, it didn't protect the, uh, secrets, Klaus Fuchs, and probably the most notorious of the, the spies uh, that provided the Soviets the blueprint for the bomb was party to all of this. And so the Soviets had uh, knowledge of our, our plan for the atomic bomb early on, but um, that was a risk. Otherwise we might not have had a bomb. So was that good or bad? I don't know. At any rate, <laughs> it was, um, an example of what came out and continued today, astrophysics, biomedical science, space exploration, all depend on this kind of collaborative work. Another thing that, that is kind of the name of your series is innovation. Uh, it's astounding how many um, innovations are reflected or were necessary to create this, um, this weapon. Uh, it was hugely complex. Uh, time was more important than money. So they did things in parallel at Oak Ridge. They built three uh, separate processes for creating enriched uranium. And these weren't little lab bench processes. These were enormous mile long buildings with thousands of gaseous fusion to cascades at the K-25 site and, and uh, 22 buildings of um, calutrons at the Y-12 site and this immense um, thermal diffusion plant, um, all going full steam, none of which worked to produce the required enrichment level, but they got creative and used one as a feed, one product as a feedstock for the next uh, technique, which then was able to get further enrichment closer to the goal. And then that finally went to the third method um, so they were always seat of the pants, <laughs> trying different things. Uh, and, uh, and yet it wasn't, it wasn't casual. They, they drew upon, we talked about the three major sites, but there were uh, thousands of other contributors who were small businesses, large businesses, all America's greatest corporations got dragged into this. Chrysler produced the huge gaseous diffusion tanks for the um, process of enriched uranium at K25 in Oak Ridge. 
Monsanto, Dow, everybody. Um, anyway, plus little guys, Coors Beer even, and no beer is prohibition. They got dragooned into making capacitors uh, out of the ceramics that the beer coolant <laughs> process involved. It, it, it's a wonderful story, wonderful story. Lots of different innovations from, from a lot of different people. Uh, and then sort of thirdly, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about diversity. Uh, often the, the early historian, you know, Richard Rhodes, you know, who was my first advisor, chairman of the board, a wonderful friend um, who wrote The Making of the Atomic Bomb in 1986. Um, he said he didn't focus on trying to, you know, be inclusive about the stories of the women or the African-Americans or others who might have contributed. I mean, it was enough 750 pages <laughs> just to cover you know, the, the main uh, elements of the, of the program. But um, in this last couple of decades, there's been more attention uh, brought to the role of women. And in fact, at Oak Ridge, you know, it was mostly women you know, that, who worked on uh, you know these these gigantic plants, uh, the calutrons, which were used uh, in the Y12 plant to separate the isotopes of uranium, um, had panels of knobs and such that had to be calibrated so that the product um, was maximized. The PhD scientists who had a hand in designing and and constructing these plants. Um, had no faith that any woman could manage this. No, as you might guess, they did really well. In fact, they are good at multitasking. They could talk and twist. And anyway, I don't know. What does that tell us? It's tell us to be <laughs> to be inclusive, uh, and that worked. It certainly worked for the Manhattan Project. Um, there were uh, a lot of people who lived in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, Los Alamos is on a high mesa, but below that were um, communities of Hispanics and Pueblos. And every morning there were buses that came up the hill. They picked them up, bring them up the hill. Uh, and these people worked uh, as technicians, janitors, clerks, housemaids, nannies. Um, you'll see in the opera that John Adams wrote about Oppenheimer, uh, you know, one of the key persons figured is, is the Pueblo nursemaid who sings to baby um, Catherine. Uh, anyway, it's, you know, how do you keep sanity? <laughs> Everybody, they needed all of the women at Los Alamos to be participating, either running the schools or running the calculations uh, about the yield of the bomb. Everybody had to, was fully employed and this enabled them to uh, use all of that talent. Um, and then finally, there was a cap on African-Americans. Uh, this was still period of segregation, World War II, army was still segregated. Um, and there was a cap on the number of African-Americans at 10 or 15% that could, could serve, but um, they were hired in that number. And uh, many of the African-Americans uh, stayed uh, where they ended up, whether it be Hanford or, or Oak Ridge in particular. And, you know, have been uh, given many opportunities uh, and in the uh, years since. So it's, it's, it was an escape from the depression era poverty of the rural South for most of them. So we have great diversity of, of um, all of these interviews, 600 of them are online. Um, they're a treasure trove. It's where the New York Times goes first thing when they have an obituary to write. There aren't many, <laughs> I'm afraid, these days because most of them are 100, 102 um, that, that remain. It's a very small fraction, but um, 20 years ago, they would check things out on online. And there's you know many, many pages. There's even a wonderful interview with Alex Wellerstein. Maybe two of them, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, anyway, 
Uh, and, you know, I know you're all scholars. It's it, many, many journalists have taken full advantage of this collection uh, to write wonderful books. And uh, we encourage your students to, uh, you know, do firsthand you know, research uh, on our sites and, and uh, have a good time. It's, it's a wonderful topic. Thank you very much. I think that's getting us to the end of this, uh, your, your particular part, in which case I will turn to Dr. Waller, Wellerstein, excuse me, uh, to go next. Hi, I'm, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you much for attending. Thank you, Cynthia, for that wonderful discussion and, and, and getting us going. It's really great. Um, I've been thinking about what I wanted to say for this. Um, and I think the way I... What I came about was essentially what are things about the Manhattan Project that I think that people often don't know that are important to sort of making sense of it historically and, uh, you know, what it means to us today, especially uh, in light of the interest from the Nolan film, of course, but just in general, we, we see invocations of the Manhattan Project all the time. We see people calling for a new Manhattan Project for this and a new Manhattan Project for that. And and uh, um, so what does that even mean? And, and, and usually what that means is people are trying to say, what if we just paid a lot of money and let scientists do, you know, maybe that's a good idea, maybe it's not. But um, I think that that's often not that's not how I think about the Manhattan Project and what it was. It wasn't just dumping a bunch of money into the hands of scientists and or and, and seeing what happened. It was something a little bit more complicated. So I want to just go over a few aspects of it that are um, to me pretty important to understanding it, and again are often not well known, um, other than maybe specialists who work on this, and and even them, you know, maybe they don't always know it. Um, so one is the nature of the project, and, and, and Cindy went into some of that already uh, in some detail. The way I like to think about the Manhattan Project is not as a science project, which is how it's usually framed. It's really an industrial project. And if we wanted to be specific, it's a sort of industrial, academic, governmental, military project, which is a little too wordy for even me, an academic um, but the easiest way to think about it is the Manhattan Project, what they were doing was not just building an atomic bomb or even three atomic bombs. What they were doing was building an entirely new industry from scratch. They were building a nuclear fuel cycle and a bomb producing sort of capability uh, in about three years. And that's very rapid for any industry. And the actual discoveries that had led to this, the discovery of nuclear fission, that had only been done in late 1938, early 1939. And so that's a very, very rapid turnaround to within sort of five years have this major industry exist. And in practice, they didn't really start building the industry until... Uh, uh, pretty much 1942. So it's not even a full of six years of effort. It's a very small amount of effort. And that's the part that makes it kind of incredible and abnormal, because usually when we have some new discovery and it can be turned into an industry, you're talking about something that takes on the scale of decades. Like if you look at like when the idea of a telegraph was had and when they actually commercialized it and became a viable product, it's like 20 years. It's not a quick turnaround. These things are not fast. The invention of the dynamo and electric lighting is separated by decades. So to go from literally tabletop science and the Han Meitner experiment can fit on a pretty large dinner table to an industry that spanned uh, the entire United States, coast to coast, um, included sites in other countries, notably Canada, uh, but even Belgian Congo. Uh, there's even a site that they used in Cuba, interestingly enough, uh, for the, some of the military operations. Um, the number of people working on it is even larger than most people think, and they think it's a pretty big amount of people. I mean, if you look up how many people worked on the Manhattan Project, if you don't find my website, what you'll find is usually a number that says, Oh, at its peak, 125,000 people worked on it, which is true. At its peak, 125,000 people were employed. Um, that's like June uh, 44. At its peak is not a measure of total 
people working on it because from month to month, people would leave the project for various reasons. Um, often they would quit because the working conditions were not great at Oak Ridge and Hanford. And also, and we'll get to this in a second, they didn't know what they were doing and they had signed up to be part of the war. And now you're doing some boring job like the ones that, you know, some of the Calutron girl type jobs, which are not very interesting or stimulating jobs, especially when you don't know what the point of them is. Um, at some of those sites, they had a turnover of like 20% of the of the personnel every month. So every time you see the number going up to that peak, that's not only that much more than the previous month, it's that much more plus the 20% they lost from the previous month. So if you integrate under that, the sort of curve of how many people worked on the project, and you look at like how many people actually were at one point actual just contractors, and even that doesn't really count every little subsidiary who might have been involved. You end up with about 500,000 people, um, potentially 600,000, depending on if you follow it into 46. And that's a lot of people. And just to put that into comparison, that's almost 1% of the entire civilian labor force in the United States during World War II. So if you are not in the a soldier and you are not too old to work or too young to work, there's about a one in a hundred chance that you worked on some aspect of the Manhattan Project. So that's what I mean by a new industry. And this 1% number, it follows the project around all through it. They used about 1% of the American electricity supply. They used about 1%, they, they generated about 1% of all of the patents uh, during World War II, though they were kept secret. So that was not as evident. Um, it was about 1% of the entire cost of World War II, it was about 1% of the GDP. And like 1%, again, it's if you imagine, oh, it's gonna be 80%, that seems small, but like 1% for one military project is huge. That, that's a very large scope. Um, so this is what I mean by creating a new industry. It's, it's a substantial development and doing it as, as Cindy pointed out in like not very much time where, where time is really the resource that needs to be conserved, not, uh, uh, how much money you spend on it. Even more remarkably, of that huge number of people, how many of them actually knew they were building an atomic bomb? And we don't actually have a fixed number for this, but my guess is that it's it's on the order of a few thousand, maybe let's say 5,000, right? So that would be about 1% of those people had some idea that they were actually building a bomb. It could be 10,000. It depends on how much of an idea you're requiring them to have, and it's hard to know how you include people, but it's not some huge number. It's not 100,000. It's probably on the order of five to 10,000 or something like that. Um, and that's, it's on, uh, you, you can't really draw parallels between that and other industries, right? It's not like an automotive industry and only 1% of the people know they're making cars, right? Like that would be absurd, right? So, so how do you even wrap your head around that? Um, what does that mean for thinking about what this project was if most of these people have no, uh, not only no input on what is going to be made, but don't even know what's going to be made, which, as I alluded to, had huge morale problems. Uh, uh, people during wartime don't want to be told you're working on something where it's clearly not like you're not like sending out tanks or airplanes or something like that. Like you're not contributing to the war immediately, but you're being told it's actually a big contribution maybe at some point. Uh, you can see why a lot of people found that very frustrating. Um, this was accomplished by the secrecy, which Cindy alluded to, um, particularly the policy of compartmentalization, which General Groves was uh, famously quite fond of. Compartmentalization simply means it's, it's the need to know principle. It's the idea that everybody working on the project knows exactly as much information as is thought to be necessary to do their immediate job. So the, the Calutron girls that, that, that Cindy alluded to, they would sit on um, uh, uh, stools and look at a meter and the meter would have a, a little you know, line on it. And if the meter goes to the left, you dial it a little bit more, so back to the center. If it goes to the right, you dial it back to the center. Um, that's what they're told their job is, that that's it. They don't know why they're what the dial is. They don't know what's behind the wall. They don't know why the, the goal of this is. Um, that's compartmentalization in a nutshell. It turns out they're aligning ion streams of uranium while they're enriching it, which I'm not sure if you told anybody that if they weren't a scientist, that would make any sense to them. But, you know, nonetheless, they weren't told it. Um, this had the effect of, aside from the working conditions, 
making it possible to do something like this in some relative amount of secrecy. I say relative amount, both because of the spies, which uh, Cindy mentioned, the, the, the Soviet spies in particular. So that's you know not exactly perfect secrecy. Um, but even things like keeping it out of newspapers, keeping it um, out of the hands of Congress. Uh, they did not want Congress to know about this because they, they did not think that they could explain this project to a suspicious senator. And they thought that a suspicious senator might reveal it in front of everybody and that would you know hurt the overall goals of secrecy and these were not idle concerns they had senators famously harry truman as a senator tried to audit the manhattan project twice um, but there were other congressmen who tried to do the same thing and threatened to bring it out um, but they really wanted to keep it out of newspapers they were somewhat successful at that but not as successful as they sort of claimed they were after the fact um it's actually quite easy today because many of these newspapers are full text searchable to go through and look for the manhattan project and find it find little references to it here and there um they were not sort of perfect at this but they did manage to keep it so that it was not like some front page story on a major newspaper it was a front page story on some very minor newspapers as an aside there was one in cleveland that had a whole story where a newspaper reporter on his vacation went to santa fe new mexico and accidentally stumbled on the manhattan project and describes it pretty well and he says oh it's some kind of secret installation in a place called los alamos and this guy named oppenheimer is running it and they're blowing stuff up it's very interesting maybe it has to do with atomic energy if you try to go there there's a bunch of guys with guns who tell you to go away it's a remarkable story you can read it on my blog if you're interested if you google worst of the manhattan project leaks which is what i've dubbed it hilariously i don't know if it's hilarious general groves was so mad at this guy uh, they got it their press control was they could stop things from syndicating so that they kept it limited to this one newspaper issue in this one pretty niche market and that was as far as it went uh but he also tried to get the uh the reporter drafted uh, as a way to get him out of his hair, but it turned out the reporter was you know, like a senior citizen. So you know, it wasn't going to happen. Um, anyway, they they managed to sort of keep it from really busting out in a way that at least the Germans or the Japanese noticed. As far as we know, they did not notice the Manhattan Project, and that's its own interesting subtopic we could talk about if you're interested in. Um, but one of the side effects of the secrecy is it also was a limitation on how many um, people were involved in discussions about what to use it, right? If only a tiny number of people know how to use what you're building, then you're already limiting who can participate in those discussions. And then the use of uh, chain of command and even more secrecy meant that the actual number of people who participated is some very, very small number. Um, and uh, there was very little oversight, very little deliberation. We are still debating whether or not these things were good ideas 80 years later. I just bring all that up because this is one of the reasons why I always caution people that the Manhattan Project should not be your model for business as usual for science and technology. I don't really love it when people are saying, let's have a Manhattan Project for this. Like, oh, do, do you mean the uh, the the secrecy and the, uh, 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 the, the, the fact that we're going to be arguing whether it was a good idea for 80 years? No, oh, no, no. We just mean the innovation part. Okay, that's fine. But this is a very strange model for innovation. It is not normal. Uh, it is not, you know, there's, even like the Apollo project in the 60s was not normal in many ways, but it's not like this. It had a whole other set of dimensions, but it doesn't have the secrecy. It's not run by the military, things like that. So, you know, I just bring that up. The Manhattan Project is super interesting. I'm, you know, obsessed with it as a subject, but also like, like we should step back and always say like, this is interesting, but this is probably not how things ought to be most of the time. This is not how, at least in a country like the United States, it's not how we want big government projects to be run uh, unless we really have to for some reason. And even then, maybe it's not, maybe there's other models. Um, other little things I wanted to bring up, a couple minutes left. Um, A lot of the people who were aware of what they were building and were involved in discussions about what to do with it, and even some who were wanted to be involved in those discussions but couldn't, they they were not just thinking of this as a one-time development that you're doing for this war. They are thinking about this as something that is going to have a big impact on the future. And that is true of the people who wanted to use the bomb and it is also true of the people who there were some people who did not want to use the bomb they were not part of the real central conversation but they tried to make themselves people like leo zillard uh, a scientist um they all were thinking not just of the thing that they were making but it as a sort of 
example of what will come down the line. And I think that's very interesting as a historian because we often think about people as being sort of just in their moment. And in this particular case, while there were people, you know, day to day doing their in their moment stuff, a lot of the people involved were thinking about what's the major implication of this? What are the implications of this for the human species? What are the hum implications of this for the next hundred years? That sort of thing. And they had different imaginations about what that future was. And you can sometimes look and see where they got them from. Some of them are extrapolating from essentially World War I, which was important to them forward. Some of them are extrapolating from science fiction that they have read and themes that came up in the 1920s and H.G. Wells and things like that. But the point is that they are all trying to imagine what the in implications are going to be and then try to imagine what they should do now to affect the best of those possible worlds and not the worst. And none of them were clairvoyant, even the ones who ended up being, you know, more or less correct. That's kind of just luck because there's a million possibilities out there. And I think that's quite interesting. I, I think in particular, the fact that like, again, you're talking about tabletop science that gets accelerated on just a ridiculously fast scale with very few people knowing about it. You're essentially saying that this tabletop science is one way or the other going to remake the entire international order. And that is unusual. That is not usually how things go in human development, even with science and technology. Certainly at, up until that point, they did not think of that as, as being a common occurrence. And I think that's quite interesting. Um, last little thing I'll say, um, big misconception about the World War II and the Manhattan Project. Um, there was no singular decision to use the bomb. There's a version of the story that is out there which is essentially Truman thought about it really hard and he weighed the pros and cons and he wanted to save lives and he wanted to avoid an invasion. And that is why he decided to go with this thing that he kind of didn't love, but he was the lesser of two evils. And that's all not true. That's an after the fact creation by the people involved in dropping the atomic bomb that they came up with um, in within a couple of years of the end of World War II uh, in the to justify this weapon in the face of criticism. And the criticism of their time was not the criticism of our time. They were not being criticized by people who, by and large, were like sympathetic with the Japanese or, or a high number of casualties or things like that. They were being criticized often by uh, 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 conservatives, by members of the military establishment who were not part of the Manhattan Project, um, people who for various, very specific reasons, um, found it useful or important to say, oh, this wasn't necessary, we didn't need to do this, etc. And so that story that now is very common was created at a specific moment for specific purposes. And historians have known for decades that it's not really true. There was no single decision. Everybody who was involved in those discussions um, essentially took for granted that the bomb was going to be used. Uh, they made the bomb, of course, they were going to use it, right? That was sort of the attitude of this. You don't make a weapon and then not use it. Um, and they all had, you know, sometimes multiple reasons for wanting to use them, including maybe it'll end the war and we won't have an invasion, though that is more complicated than than I think people often make it out to be. They That was not the only option for avoiding an invasion uh, that was on the table. Um, but they had other reasons, including some of them, like Secretary of State Jimmy Burns was pretty explicit that he thought that this was going to be useful to uh, sort of intimidate the Soviets. That wasn't the only reason even he wanted to use it. And it certainly wasn't the only reason they dropped the bomb, but it was in the mix of things that some of those people saw as advantages. There were some people who saw it as, uh, again, to get back to this question of thinking about the future, some of the scientists clearly believed that the future of nuclear weapons was going to be much scarier than World War II. And it was important for people to see how scary these weapons could be so that they will like get their act together and not have another World War III. And so that's a different kind of justification. There's also careerist reasons. For all of his justifications, Groves was like very committed to like having this project he took on be successful. And that clearly drove a lot of his decisions. Um, he was pretty explicit about that. And that's very mundane, but that's one of the factors. And so my point is just one, no single decision, uh, no real deliberation over whether it was going to be used. Uh, two, lots of reasons for people wanting to use it, not a singular reason. And individual people, as we know, can have multiple reasons for doing things. Uh, the use of it, 
because of the conditions under which it was made and who was allowed in those discussions and so on, was what we sometimes call overdetermined. Like there were so many reasons that those people thought they would use it and so very few reasons for them not to want to use it. Um, and uh, uh, so it's, 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 it's understandable in a sense, whether you agree with using it or not, why they all sort of went in that direction. And then secondly, uh, uh, along with this, Truman had a very peripheral role in all of this, and that is often not understood. My next book is all about Truman and nuclear policy, so you're, 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 check it out, 2025 is the goal. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll be back here. But Truman uh, was not really involved and in, didn't even weigh in on almost any of the use of the bomb issues. Uh, that doesn't mean the bomb wasn't important to him. After they tested it at Potsdam, he was very interested in it because he thought it it, it gave him leverage with the Japanese and maybe the Soviets. Um, but that doesn't mean that he was like very closely involved with things. He did not decide to use it. He knew about the plans. He did not alter them in any particular way. And so that's his sort of role. It's non-interference, as Groves put it. Um, that doesn't mean that he doesn't have some responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the story we have is this common one is not correct. Uh, last thing I'll say, and then I'm done. The end of World War II is way more complicated than it often gets depicted in popular media. It's not a simple case of the nukes like ending the war. It's also not a simple argument to say the nukes didn't end the war or to argue that they were unnecessary. It's just a very messy thing. I'm happy to talk more about the messiness in the Q&A if people are interested. But like, there's a lot of things going on at once. There's a lot of considerations. You have to also think about what the Japanese were thinking and doing. That's its whole other side of the story. There's a Soviet side of the story. Um, the point of this is, is I've studied this pretty closely and I don't have any strong answers on, you know, were the bombs necessary to end the war? Uh, I don't know, because we can't redo it all with one variable tweaked and see what the outcome would be. Uh, there's so many things happening at once. It's hard to isolate what's actually causing what uh, event. Um, my only point to you is if anybody comes to you with a, a story that's very clean, OK, the bombs did end the war, no question, or the bombs didn't end the war and were unnecessary, be suspicious, because that's covering up a lot of nuance no matter what they're doing. I sit in the middle and make everybody irritated because I'm always like, well, you, you, we just really don't know. And we're probably never, there's no way to know. So we just have to accept that. And we don't like to accept that. And it's interesting to think about why we don't like to accept that and to, to just wrap up and stop. Uh, we don't like to accept that because the story of the Manhattan Project and the atomic bombings is not just a historical story. It's, it's not just like an interesting bit of hi history. It's one of these stories that we map politics onto and map our identities onto and the identities of the United States and of our relatives and of, you know, grandpa and, and things like that. And it's one of the reasons we feel very strongly about it. And that's all good. I'm glad this is important history, but I, uh, I'm always sort of urging people to, to step back a little bit and examine what the pre, you know, what, what are your pre-commitments? What, why do you want to see it one way versus another? What does that get you? What doesn't it get you? Because that's often quite interesting. All right. I'm going to stop talking very much looking forward to Q and a thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, both of you. We don't seem to have our third participant. Uh, the UFOs took him, I suppose. Uh, we have some questions, and I'm going to encourage other people to put more in, again, either to the QRA or chat button. I'm going to ask a, a one, for, for at least for myself, uh, this whole bit about it being an industrial process. Did that, was the industry endangered with the budget cuts after 45 and 46 as we shifted back to a civilian economy how did is there an important story about how the nuclear weapon industry was preserved between say 45 46 47 i uh, i mean yes and i i say this both because this is a large part of my next book is about um but what happens is the manhattan project kind of falls apart after World War II ends. Um, the goal had been to essentially quickly pass legislation that would establish what, who's even running this thing, right? Because it was being run by the, 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 the Army Corps of Engineers, but like, this is a very temporary secret sort of thing. They're doing this with sort of secret budgets, et cetera, et cetera. What happens in peacetime? And there was this big drive to pass immediate legislation in the fall of 45, uh, and it failed for a lot of reasons. Um, the Congress said, 
we're not going to go that fast. And even the president said, uh, uh, we're not going to go that fast. And um, the result of this was it was in this kind of limbo until basically the end of 1946 when the Atomic Energy Commission took it over. And while it was in that limbo, I mean, it, 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 it had been set up on a very short term basis and and some of these buildings that Cindy is mentioning that are you know what what was the exact phrase of the non architecturally stupendous or whatever it was right <laughs> this is what happens when you're like doing very fast and and those are like a light motif for all sorts of stuff they're doing like they're not really getting rid of their waste effectively they're not like doing safety evaluations of their experiments right they they're doing like this very ad hoc wartime thing and uh it starts to just break apart at the seams people go home uh, uh there are also technical problems because they rush these facilities in the production so like hanford gets not quite shut down but but put down to a very low output because they're worried that their reactors are breaking because they have unforeseen problems in them um uh so they they basically stop making bombs after world war ii they make material but not really weapons. And so when David Lilienthal becomes the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission in, in 47, he does an inspection and he finds that there are zero assembled atomic bombs. Like they don't have a nuclear arsenal. That they And the weapons that they have, I've been looking at a lot of this stuff recently for my next book, but like they describe them as like a scientific monstrosity. Like these are not military weapons. They don't even want to call them weapons because they're like science experiments that require people who are really good at assembling them. D just to put into context, the people who assemble these bombs on Tinian, two of them later win Nobel prizes and not for assembling the bombs, obviously. But I mean, I just want to give you an idea of the level of like talent required to do this in those that first generation of things. Um, so what happens is that it takes the Atomic Energy Commission a lot of the year of 1947 to get like to even get up to where they were during the war in terms of stable production and and, and that. And then over the course of the 40s, they start to sort of ramp, you know, modern, not really modernize, but sort of make more peacetime this whole apparatus and increase the production. And that's why by the end of the 40s, early 50s, the U.S. actually can produce atomic bombs that could actually be used. And that sets up the precondition for like the Eisenhower era, which like you can produce dozens of bombs per day if you want to, as opposed to like a couple per month or something. So the answer is the whole thing falls apart in a really dramatic way. And the fact that it falls apart is one of the biggest secrets of the post-war period because the U.S. does not really have a nuclear arsenal that it can effectively use for many years. It has a much smaller nuclear capability than even elected officials realize. I've been going over a lot of this stuff because this is core to Truman. Uh, a lot of my book, my next book is, is Truman after World War II, which often gets Truman and the bomb, mostly after Hiroshima and Nagasaki because that's often overlooked. And uh, there's a whole period in which, like, the, the, even he is not sure how many bombs there are. And he basically says, I don't really want to know. And they, like, say, like, you ought to know. Somebody ought to know, right? Like, we shouldn't not have people know. But, like, this is so, it's so small. You know, in 1947, I think they have 13 nuclear weapons that they could theoretically put together. But none of them are ready to go. Like, that's a very... The world thinks the U.S. is this nuclear power, and it's kind of not at that point. By 1940, by 1950, they have a few hundred nuclear weapons, so they've they've worked up the the capabilities. But anyway, so yeah, it it it, it doesn't work that well. The transition. Hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kelly. Do you want to add to this? Well, I think Alex uh, nailed it. I do think that people should understand that this was a new science. Yeah whole science of, of nuclear weapons uh, they invented. Uh, and some of them who were patriotic and dedicated and wanted to be the Nazis uh, were all in through that period of the war. But then they said, that's it. You know, they were aghast, many of these scientists. They didn't realize that the army's plan was, hey, you got the world's super duper weapon, you want more of it. You know, <laughs> Their plan was not to just build what was necessary to end World War II, but they wanted you know, to build an arsenal of these. 
which uh, many of the scientists, you know, they're academics, they're not into war. <laughs> uh, they were appalled. So they went back to their universities. So they lost, there was a huge brain drain. Uh, and these people went, went into different fields, some of them. They just said, I, I don't even want to do anything have to do with nuclear science. I'm going into microbiology or whatever it was. Very talented people, but you know, they were not signed up for World War III, <laughs> for sure. Thank you. I'm going to go to the questions. I, I, I'm going actually to the most basic one first. Why was it called the Manhattan Project from Bob Olesh? For and either of you, that was, uh, you, you want to take it? It was it was convention. They they thought if they named it uh, something cute or something that that might be uh, like two alloys was what the Brits called their parallel effort uh, to develop an atomic bomb. Uh, that it would be kind of ham handed, and then people would say, "Wait a minute, what? What's tube alloy? I mean, or, or whatever name they came up." So they used the Army Corps of Engineers names projects based on the place of incorporation, basically. And they had offices at 270 Broadway in Southern Manhattan. Um, today they're apartment buildings, but they were then offices, and uh, they named it the Manhattan Engineer District. Manhattan Project for short. So it's born in New York. And the reason it's in New York is that's the hub of the industrial contractors, right? So if you do a look at all the contractors, it's all the Northeastern, it's that whole Bowash, Pennsylvania, whatever corridor, right? And again, this is what I mean by the industrial aspect of it that gets overlooked, right? Like they put it there because that's how you meet contractors. You want to be close to them. Um, and that's the big part of the project is building stuff. So uh, that's what the Army Corps engineer. They did have one official other code name, which is like the tube alloys. This was the Development of Substitute Materials Project. And this was given as this was meant to be the like secret code name. And Groves thought this is too like provocative. Like this is too weird. Substitute material. What is why don't we just keep it Manhattan? That means nothing to anybody. And other than the city, and it's in fact a little bit misleading because even though their offices are there, most of the activities are not there. They're some they're in other states, so that's why they decided not to use DSM. Though sometimes in the records you'll see it called the DSM Development of Substitute Materials Project, but that was the uh, that was seen as even just too provocative. Thank you. So I'm going to go to another question from the audience. Um, uh, C. C. O. F. E. Uh, PhD, uh, to Dr. Wellerstein, as a historian, would you know whether John von Neumann, who invented game theory and was deeply involved in U.S. nuclear st strategy advising, ever wrote anything on game theory applied to nuclear deterrence? I've not been able to find any, which seems very odd, including having looked in the Los Alamos Library and Archive, cl classified and unclassified. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And while I saw the question earlier and I was looking around a little bit while while Cindy was talking, because I was thinking, oh, well, that's a lot. I hadn't really thought about that. And my sense is no. My sense is that he did not write on nuclear. He did not apply game theory to nuclear strategy, even though, A, it was probably what was getting him thinking about game theory. And B, people clearly saw it as relevant like the first rand reports where they're applying game theory to deterrence come out in like 1951 like right around when he's doing this kind of work and so um i think it's interesting i i think von neumann is a pretty complicated and interesting and fascinating character for those who don't know him he was deeply involved in the manhattan project and the hydrogen bomb work and um is one of the uh, cited as one of the inventors of computers and is considered one of the great mathematical geniuses of the 20th century. He's the guy that all the other people we think of as geniuses, they thought he was the genius, right? Like Einstein thought von Neumann was a genius. And, and Oppenheimer, like, like that's the level. He's like a whole order of magnitude above them in their eyes. Um, and he was involved in a lot of really important Cold War panels and projects. Like, like he was his, he ran a committee that basically said after the H-bomb was tested, um, we should be building long range missiles because we'll be able to shrink H-bombs to fit on them. And that's what starts essentially the ICBM program, an intercontinental ballistic missile program. Um, so it is interesting that he doesn't seem to have taken this thing he did, game theory, which is 
core to discussing nuclear deterrence and nuclear strategy and done anything much to apply it himself. But I suspect that for him, these are like, I don't know, two different parts of his mind or something. I mean, I, again, I think he, there's no question that his work in game theory is in part inspired by these dynamics because it's about competitive dynamics. And he's very cold warrior, famously an advocate of preventive nuclear war, uh, preemptive nuclear war against the Soviet Union. But um, it seems like he didn't himself apply it. It seems more like he left other people to do it and maybe he was working on other things. But I've never seen anything by von Neumann that's about nuclear strategy. Even the stuff we know about preemptive war are accounts that people later said he said this thing out loud, but not like something he wrote down as actual formal uh, strategy. And why he wouldn't do that, I don't know. That's just maybe not how he saw what his contribution was gonna be, I don't know. He died in 54, so like maybe he was gonna do it and didn't, but he, he, he died quite pr uh, prematurely. Um, and so, uh, you know, who knows? And Dr. Kelly, do you have something to add to that or? Oh, yeah. No. And, and, and I see your question, is it, is it possible to classify? I'm sure there's some stuff of his that's classified. Like I've had a heck of a time tracking down some of these reports on committees he was on and things like that, because I'm you know curious about everything. But I I suspect that if he had made a contribution along these lines, it would be cited by somebody else. And I've never seen that. And so to me, it's very, sometimes the lack of a thing, it's not quite the same thing as evidence. But if there are people at the Rand Corporation working with von Neumann, right, writing about how to apply von Neumann's theories to nuclear deterrence, which they are from the 50s onward, it would be really odd for me for them not to note if he had not actually done this himself. <laughs> that would seem like unlikely. So for me, my guess is he didn't do it. it could be, if he did, Nobody saw it. That's that's sort of where I feel like we are with this. <laughs> he said it was solvable and went back to bed. Um, I have he was a, a busy guy, to be sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he invented game theory like while he was traveling between all these multiple weapons projects. I mean, it, 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 it you know, it, come on, give the guy a break is all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I have a query from John Chesky. Has there been any comprehensive statistical analysis slash study of the health of the workers who worked at the three major Manhattan Project facilities to try to measure their exposure to radioactive products and that effect thereof on their health as they lived their lives after World War II, including you know cancer deaths? And then the recollection that Richard Feynman, who worked there, died for some rather rare cancers. Um, Ms. Kelly, first, uh, you have an answer to this. Well, there. this was a very primitive stage of understanding radioactive exposure and what it did. Uh, there's a wonderful book by the grandson of one of the doctors who worked at Los Alamos, I and mean, there were only five of them. So Lewis Hempelman was the top guy, and this guy, John Nolan, was his, his close lieutenant. Uh, the two of them had to set what were, what were the permissible limits uh, for exposure by these workers. And at that time, in 1933, the federal government had set a standard of one tenth rem. Rem was a the unit they were using to to measure exposure, um, but that was clearly so small a level that you know no one no one would be allowed to work on it. So they toyed with well, what about five or what about ten rem uh, as as being uh, an acceptable level of dose? And they consulted with the people who are out there working with. Um, you know, the special nuclear materials getting, you know, some, some level of exposures. And they, the people who are working on it said, no, I think 25 or 50 RAM is fine. At any rate, they were just, it, it was arbitrary. They picked, they picked five and then it, I think within a year they changed it to 10. Anyway, with that standard, they had film badges. They would try to monitor how much exposure employees were getting. Uh, to um, you know the, the nuclear materials, but it wasn't um, it wasn't a rigorous science. Because, I mean, it wasn't. They didn't know when was uh, how much was too much, and in fact, most of the the participants were quite cavalier. Um, they felt fine. <laughs> they did their job. They were focused on doing their jobs. 
I don't know, they, they um, it was only later, I think. I mean, I worked at DOE, as I say, in the 90s, and then a lot of cases were coming up, especially uh, among well, either people who lived in the surrounding areas who felt that their well water had been contaminated. In fact, in many cases, they were correct, but um, it was it was later that they they began to do epidemiological studies uh, and look at the downwinders at Hanford. Um, there was you know a case of the downwinders at Hanford went on for twenty five years. Um, I have an interview with a woman who led that effort, uh, Tricia Pritikin. Uh, that I highly recommend, but uh, all all the, the deck was clearly stacked against the plaintiffs, uh, and the government hired all the white shoe law firms available to to uh, fight any any um, effort to get compensation and to recognize the harm that might have been done uh, to the workers and the downwinders. It's not not a pretty story. So maybe Alex can fill in the gaps, but that sort of uh, my impression. There have been some attempts to to do studies of this sort at like Los Alamos and things like that. But as as Cindy said, it's 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 not only have these been like very after the fact ish, but but they're also it, it's it's very hard to it's messy. It's messy epidemiologically. Um, probably saying things that people on here may know but I'll just repeat it like like any individual cancer you can't usually pinpoint what the possible source was right some cancers are more associated with certain types of things right and so that's suggestive but even then it's a probabilistic thing so what you do is you the epidemiological approach is to say okay let's look at a cohort of how many people it is and let's look at the rates of the cancers, and then let's compare that to some sort of baseline population of similar people of ages and you know backgrounds and so on living somewhere else, and see where there's excess cancers. And then if the excess, if there's an excess, if, if if one group has way more bone cancers in it, then you can say, okay, there was an increased risk of this amount for bone cancer for people in this situation. And that's hard to do. That's hard to do even when like things are well controlled and you're monitoring people who have been living in the same area for a long time, et cetera, much less like decades later for people who've moved around. And and also a lot of these people got exposed to a lot of different kinds of possible contaminants over the course of their lives also. Uh, uh, these, I, and I don't say this to belittle anybody's claims or anything, but I just, in the sense of the complexity of it, like... I, I get told all the time, I get people all the time who will call them home to me and they say, okay, my grandfather was in the army and he was at this one test and then he died of cancer 40 years later. Do you think it caused it? And it's like, I don't know. Like there's a million possibilities there. Like what else did he do with his life? Cause that probably wasn't the only thing in his life nor the only carcinogen. Also you have a base rate of getting cancer in the United States is like, like 40% or something like that. It's very high. So like, it's higher than most people realize. So like, is that part of his base rate or is it because did he also smoke? Did he also have all these other risk factors? Um, did he just do that in his military career? Because sometimes these people will be doing, oh yeah, and then he worked at a beryllium factory. Okay, well, I mean, that's, a <laughs> you know, there's other exposures, right? And and my point is just like, ah, it, it, the unsatisfying aspect is it's very hard to know these things. And it is very easy, especially with, you know, you mentioned Feynman. Von Neumann died of brain cancer in 54. Uh, Fermi died of stomach cancer in 50 something. Oppenheimer died of throat cancer in uh, uh, 67. Like a lot of these Manhattan Project people die of, die of cancer, some of which are sometimes associated with radioactive exposures. Um, Still, that isn't really an epidemiological thing. That's something you can say, yeah. Uh, but to go beyond saying, well, maybe, uh, is I, I don't think we actually have the data. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. And I don't want the lack of the data to be... But one of my concerns as a historian is that when we don't have data, that often is used as they, well, if we don't really know, then we might as well assume it didn't happen. Well, I don't know, like maybe not, maybe it did happen. We, we don't know one way or the other. Uh, but that I understand that's extremely unsatisfying. So my, my understanding is that 
the, the studies they have done um, tend to show that if there are any like toxic or cancer consequences, they're, they're very slight to the point of not being easily detectable. But I don't have a lot of faith that that actually encompasses the full story. So like, what is that worth? I don't know. Like, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. So I, I, I'm a little bit unclear. I think the uh, tag is absence of evidence is not absent. There, ev absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I'm going to free associate from that one. Um, did the Manhattan Project um pioneer any statistical techniques? You know, in manufacturing, in you know, scientific experiment, and was it hampered by the lack of statistical techniques which would have were developed in the post-war era? That's a really good question. I think that they, some of the stuff they were dealing with already existed, right? So like radiation, health physics already existed as a field. They took the, they, they, they'd had the, the radium girls of the twenties and they'd had other examples that were building up from, and they took the people who were really good at that and essentially hired them as part of the Manhattan project. They had a whole health aspect in in rochester which you know did things some things that were good and some things that are kind of horrible like they they injected some people with plutonium without their knowledge to see how it moved through their system okay uh great good job guys and uh uh but like i don't think that was probably the hamper i do think that if i was going to say the biggest hamper is is what cindy was mentioning about not really knowing what to set things to be and a lot of them un, by modern standards clearly underestimated. Like, I mean, today I believe the APA regulation for people who work in the nuclear industry. So people have already voluntarily, voluntarily entered into a potentially increased radiation environment uh, is like five rem lifetime. Like, like to give you a sense of how off those numbers are for like, oh yeah, maybe five or 20 REMs okay for this month. Like that's a huge number by modern amounts. Like if you're counting actual REM exposures, you're like an order of magnitude higher than you ought to be. Some in real life, more like three orders of magnitude higher than what you would expect from like regular interactions in the world. Um, so like they they tended to want to believe that what they were doing was doable and and also not like horribly dangerous like i think that they didn't want to see answers that would cause them to have to reevaluate the whole thing and tended to use the uncertainty as a way to eh, it's probably fine and and that's a really common thing throughout the cold war right uh if you think that what you're doing is extremely important, which most, you know, they certainly did in World War II, and the people who stayed on afterwards certainly did. Um, you tend to work out a worldview that accepts that, that what you're doing is not super dangerous, that you actually have a lot of control, and like, it's actually pretty easy. And 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 we know this is just like the, it's like the world's most common fallacy for risk. Uh, everybody thinks that what they do is mostly a good idea until, you know, something horrible happens. Well, I'm going to have an actually a question then, uh, I think from Ms. Kelly first. I mean, what is the current memory of the Manhattan Project focused on? And how should I put this? What do people remember that is accurate and important? What do they remember that is not accurate and important? Um, I, what, what, how has this been changing in the last generation? So are you talking about the participants or you're talking about people in general? Oh, popular memory, yeah, with the American popular, what people now, what do people now think about the Manhattan Project? What do they think that's true? What do they think that just ain't so? Well, I mean, I don't know if I can answer that. I can only say uh, what, uh, I think there's a phenomenon that we look at history in the prism of our own time. So if you look at the, history of the Civil War, um, you know, at first it was uh, interpreted as, you know, a, a very horrible wrenching experience for our union. But when you get to Woodrow Wilson's era, and this is right after uh, Teddy Roosevelt had 
and uh, said, you know, we ought to be building our young men, their bodies and make them strong. The war got interpreted as uh, a fight between uh, these two uh, very healthy young, you know, cons consorts of young men. I mean, I, it was, it's kind of weird that it, it, it wasn't, they didn't talk about, I don't think it was until the fifties uh, or later that they began to talk about slavery as, as, a, as a root cause of the civil war. I mean, I, I have a friend who's done this study and I read it 10 years ago, I'm not remembering exactly, but the general point is we look at the history through the prism of our own times. So clearly during the 80s, when there's a lot of anti-movement, you know, Reagan was in charge and he was rattling the saber um, with the Russians and, and so forth. And everybody was on high alert. Um, I'm sure they thought of the Manhattan Project in a different way than in times where it was peaceful and, and we want to tamp down war. I mean, it, just look at what this war in Ukraine all of a sudden, we're back in worrying about whether Russia is going to launch uh, weapons. And so maybe people are more positively inclined to think about the Manhattan Project as a very positive development. Like, I, I can't, I'm just guessing. I mean, I haven't done any studies to see what people think. I um, defer to Alex, what do you think? I mean, I, I can only, I don't have any systematic things I have anecdotes as somebody who teaches and gets asked a lot of questions and keeps a finger on the online pulse, whatever that's worth in this world. Um, I think that, again, I think that there's this interesting aspect, which is like the Manhattan Project as a symbol and one that is sometimes disentangled from the question of what do people think about the atomic bombings, right? Like these are interesting. If you ask somebody, what's the Manhattan Project versus how do you feel about the atomic bombings? I think you're touching different sort of emotional registers and people are more willing to speak, you know, sort of with awe and pride about the Manhattan Project, even if they are a little bit uncomfortable about the atomic bombings. I've had discussions with people about like, it actually gets to, to I mean, um, somebody was talking about earlier about like diversity and things. And, and there's a big effort to like honor Manhattan Project, overlooked Manhattan Project participants, right? African Americans, women, um, some Asian Americans, Native Americans near Los Alamos, et cetera. And, uh, and I'm happy to talk about these things, but I'm also like, I don't know, like, do you want a big plaque that says you built the bomb that was dropped on two? I guess a kind of a complicated and controversial issue. And I don't, I would ask these people how they felt about it. Cause again, they didn't, in most cases, uh, not always the case. There were some people who were involved at a level in all these groups, uh, at least with uh, African-American women who knew what the actual like point of the project was what the end goal was but most of the people working on the project didn't know that and so like even including them in that group i don't know how i would feel if it turned out something i was doing had you know for better or worse you know had obvious human impact consequences both on the people in japan but also set things up for a whole world afterwards which is kind of scary at times and and the point is it's just it's a mixed thing but when we say like oh yes the manhattan project that seems positive but when we say oh yeah they were part of the bombing of hiroshima and nagasaki okay that's whoa whoa that's a whole other controversial thing there have been surveys done every year or two on certainly every five years on like how people feel about the necessity of the atomic bombings of Japan. And those are only interesting in as much as they show a distinct correlation with age. <laughs> so the older you are, the more likely you think the bombs were necessary and the younger you are, the more likely you are to question them. And uh, I don't know if that's like a sliding scale, like you just get older and become more happy with them or if it's a generational thing or whatever. But that's the only sort of thing that jumps out as like obvious major thing, um, though there are some of those questions that one of the last ones I saw, they asked some sort of factual questions. And it was clear that a lot of people didn't. I'm not I'm not disparaging the opinions of anybody, but like they asked, like, which country got the bomb first? And you have people answering that wrong 
saying like, you know, Italy. And you're like, okay, what, what, what do you even make of this? Right? Like, I don't understand. How do you answer this question one way? Like what, how do you have an opinion on a thing? I mean, but that's, you know, that's obviously you ask anybody about anything, you'll get a mixture. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Larry, and this is actually going to Alex. Yeah. Um, again, everyone. Um, I have had the impression after reading some of Truman's comments and looking at his actions after the bomb was first dropped that Truman was a bit surprised by the destruction and then inserted himself more directly into the decision process. How does that match with what you've read? Well, Larry, you are going to have to read my next book is what I'm going to say, because I don't want to get into a whole thing on this. But like, yeah, I think Truman actually did not... Um, I think it is quite interesting to look at what Truman thought about the bombs before they were used and after they were used. And it is, I think, very clear that certainly the loss of life, uh, particularly what, what he termed uh, women and children, which are sort of Truman's categories for innocent life. This is like Truman was all these people who had like they call them Trumanisms, like little phrases that clearly like they're not just the literal words, but they represent something for him that he uses very throughout his life and women and children is the Truman phrase for like people you're not supposed to target. And he was very disturbed by when he got the casualty. He, he didn't get casualty reports from Hiroshima until all the morning of August 8th and his whole disposition on nuclear weapons changes and how he talks to people. And what my book is going to be about, I'm not spoiling it, but I'll be about it is the fact that, we associate Truman exclusively as the president who used the bomb, which, you know, I'm OK with at some level. He was OK with that. He took responsibility for everything, even if he was peripheral for it. But he that was his sort of philosophy of governance, the, the whole buck stops here thing. And I'm not opposed to that. I actually think that's a lot better than dodging responsibility. So, OK, good for him. But um, his actual role in the use of the bomb was pretty peripheral, as I noted. Um, his understanding of what was going on is, I think, quite flawed. And uh, I actually think that he did not understand there was going to be a high loss of civilian life at Hiroshima. You might say, how could that be possible? It's a whole long argument. It'll be a great book, but you have to look very closely at what Truman's under interactions about the bomb are before Hiroshima. And um and as far as I can tell, he was never told Nagasaki was about to happen. I think that came as a total surprise to him. Um, he There was one opportunity in which he, if he had been paying close attention, he might have understood there were two bombs about to be used. But even then, it's not clear he was really told that. Uh, there, there was sort of garbled wartime communication stuff. Um, anyway, to your bigger point, after Nagasaki... Truman is told on August 10th that there's going to be another bomb ready in a week. And that's when he becomes assertive and he stops the use of further bombing. He tells his cabinet that he couldn't bear to kill, quote, all those kids. Um, he makes it so that no weapon, nuclear weapons can be used without presidential approval, which is still the system we have today. Um, and just asserts that. And that becomes the beginning of a whole different approach to nuclear weapons decision making. And it's quite a complicated, wonderful, fascinating story. That's what the next book is about. It'll be tentatively called The Atomic President, but it's about Truman's legacy of the bomb. And unlike most books about Truman and the bomb, it is not about the lead up to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Obviously, chapter one and two have to get do that because that's important. But the rest of the book is actually about the 40s. And in particular, uh, a lot of it's going to be about the Korean War and why the bomb doesn't get used in the Korean War. So anyway, look forward to it. It's going to be really great. <laughs> Thank you. And Ms. Kelly, do you want to add to that? I think that was well said. In that case, I will go to a question from Cheryl Ballinger. It was amazing how few theoretical physicists were available in the US to participate in the Manhattan Project. Uh, with our current state of education, do we have sufficient numbers today? And I'm going to actually be a little cruel and ask you to make a qualitative evaluation. I'm sure there's a lot of people who have the PhD, the credentials, uh, but that's distinct from having the uh, actual capacities. Do people want to speak to that? Yeah, I guess I must say that Oppenheimer had a phenomenal network of people that he drew upon. And he called them 
his luminaries. I mean, these were people, there were 27 people with Nobel prizes that are, either had them at the time or, or would receive them in their lifetimes who worked on the Manhattan Project. Um, Oppenheimer thought a hundred people was all he needed, a hundred scientists and their families were all that were needed to produce, design and test this bomb. Obviously at the end of the war, there were 5,000 people at Los Alamos. I mean, most of them were support staff and military police and the like, but you know, I think we were estimating there'd be a, you know, several hundred um, scientists. And then they just recruited junior scientists. These people didn't, some of them had a semester of college. Some of them had, you know, like two years, maybe three who were recruited out of the army. They were given aptitude tests. They were obviously very talented young people. Uh, you know, again, I interviewed over a hundred of them uh, and was so impressed at, uh, at their caliber. I mean, even when they were 85 or 90, recalling all of these things that happened to them in their 20s. But they were, didn't have the training, but again, physics was a new subject. Um, Oppenheimer started uh, you know, theoretical physics high under, uh, in the United States. Most people learned it um, in the 30s and gotten again, that, that, that was you know, in the movie, that's where Oppenheimer sat in class with Werner Heisenberg, who developed the German project. He was in charge of the German project. They knew each other. They were within a year or two of their age. Um, so it was a young man's game and there weren't that many in the world who had been schooled in this subject. So they took a lot of raw talent and taught them. And again, as, as we started out this conversation, I think Alex said, you know, it really wasn't a science project. It was an engineering project. It was an uh, industrial project. It's a kind of a, a project that demanded um, creativity and innovation and, and, as, and a tinkerer. I mean, Lawrence was the experimental physicist and he was the one who was better designed to build all this equipment. He, he leaned on Oppenheimer to help explain, well, what's going on inside that big calutron <laughs> and help us, you know, kind of, make sure it's doing the best, it's optimized, but, but uh, that was the theory. And they, they, they were pragmatists and they were building things. And so they needed a whole variety of people, not just theoretical physicists. They already had the physics. That, that happened in late 1938 with the discovery of fission of uranium. It was how do you harness this energy and get it in a small enough uh, contraption that can fit in the bomb bay of a plane. That was really the challenge. And, it, and it's important to remember that before the atomic bomb, theoretical physics was considered mostly worthless. And I don't mean that in a disparaging sense, but like it, the idea was like, this has no implications on anything most of the time, right? And uh, not everybody believed that, but that's the sort of like, it's like being a mathematician. You don't get into math. You don't become a mathematician because you're trying to like fix the world, right? That's not what the point of that game is. There are these really great covers of Time Magazine, and I I use this when I teach. But they're 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 Albert Einstein on the every time in his life he was on the cover of Time Magazine, and in the first two. So Albert Einstein was famous by 1918, and in the first two, which are from the 20s and 30s, he's He's like in his pajamas and like staring off into space with crazy hair, right? And he's being like science grandpa, right? And he's 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 sort of like, and it's all about like, oh, this is a guy who thinks about stuff that doesn't even matter. His head is in the clouds. Look at him gazing airily out and thinking big thoughts, like all the tropes, right? And then in 46, he was on the cover and he's wearing a suit. He's combed his hair a little bit. He's staring right at you. And there's a mushroom cloud behind him and somebody has written E equals MC squared on the mushroom cloud, just in case you're wondering, right? In case it isn't blunt enough, but like, it turns out theoretical physics is really important that the stuff that was, again, bare, not even a generation ago seen as like, how interesting, but not relevant is now like the fate of nations, the fate of civilization. And so that's a big difference in like, what happens in after World War II. The other thing is after Sputnik, 
this is getting a little more into the weeds, but after Sputnik, one of the reforms that happens after the U.S. gets Sputniked by the Soviet Union in 57 is major educational reforms. So the National Defense Education Act, uh, DSHEA of, I think, 58, 57, I think it's 58, basically tries to increase do a bunch of things that will increase what they call the scientific manpower of the United States across the board. So the idea is that if science and technology is what's fueling the Cold War, then we need as many scientists in many different fields, not just theoretical physics, but all sorts of fields. We need to be able to compete with the Soviet Union, who also has a pretty large population. And unlike the United States, has these like pre-commitments to, you know, finding whoever is smartest and making them work for them. Whereas in the United States, we don't like force people to become anything. They do it if they want to. And also the United States educational system is super fragmented. It was then, it is now, right? Like individual school boards and things. So they did things to like dramatically increase the amount of STEM education in schools to standardize STEM education, even in places where like they don't have facilities. Well, we can watch movies about how to do experiments, right? They did a lot of things that we'll recognize today as, you know, maybe helpful, maybe not educational things. It's like Zoom all over again. Um, and that's where we get this big push for STEM that we still have today. And I teach an engineering school. I'm not opposed to it. But like, like that, the idea that like STEM equals jobs equals great equals security, that's 57 onward. And if you do a graph of physics PhDs in the United States, you see this huge exponential growth after 57. Um, you then see the whole thing crash in the 70s. And then because it turns out there is a limit on how many theoretical physicists and physicists you can employ. Uh, and then it goes back up in the 90s and then it crashes again. Um, one of my advisors when I was a graduate student, uh, Dave Kaiser at MIT, he's a historian of physics. He works on this like very extensively and has written several books and art many articles about um, essentially the demographics of physics in the Cold War and how that changes. It's fascinating. It's fascinating not just because of the number of people, but as Cindy was mentioning, like theoretical physics in the 30s is this intimate affair. You're like in these tiny little seminars and like learning and you're talking about philosophy and like it's all these things and you can't scale that up to a thousand people in a class. It doesn't work that way. And so this is actually to go back to Feynman, Feynman diagrams become really useful, not just because they're a useful way of working out certain types of quantum math, but because they're really easy to teach to an auditorium compared to a lot of other types of theoretical physics. And in fact, like theoretical physics, especially in the United States, gets a reputation for essentially banning philosophy because we don't have time to talk about complementarity and Niels Bohr and uncertainty. Just do the math. It's math, man. And uh, this becomes like a big issue. Anyway, if you're interested, look up Dave Kaiser at MIT. Unfortunately, there's many people named Dave Kaiser, but there's only one at MIT. And he has several fascinating books. One is about the history of Feynman diagrams. One is about what happens when the market crashes in the 70s called How the Hippies Save Physics. Fascinating book. I don't know if his other big book on on all this has come out yet, but he's but he works on this stuff very. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Sorry, that was, I, I was wondering if my sound had cut out. That was a really <laughs> sudden stop. Okay. Um, thank you both so much. We're going to get, I think, to the bit where I ask you both to do a concluding uh, you know, 30, 60 seconds, um, a oh, reverse order. Um, Professor Wellerstein, you first. Concluding thoughts. Ah, I mean, there's so many, as you can tell, I'm all over the place with thoughts. Um, I will just, here's what I'll do, uh, because I got a couple questions about this that are related in, in the chats, which is essentially like, if, if the military later criticized the use of the bomb, why use the bomb? And the answer is those members of the military, A, didn't criticize it at the time, which is interesting, right? We have no evidence that any of them actually voiced these concerns they claim they had. Uh, two, the reason they were voicing them in the later after the war is that they believe that the world and the United States and Truman be were believing that if you had atomic bombs, you didn't need a conventional military. And so for them, the atomic bomb uh, needed to be sort of taken down a peg because they were still they didn't want to see their budgets get cut as a result of reliance on nuclear weapons to keep the peace and, and so on and so on, which is only to say, and I don't think they're, obviously they learned to love the bomb. They learned that they can get as many budgets as they want. They can do 
they can chew gum and walk at the same time. But the point is that the politics of the 40s are not the politics of now, right? Like that's my bigger point about thinking about the bomb. The way we talk about this history and who it matters to, it depends on like what's going on in our world at the moment. Um, and it, this is why I say it's important to sort of step back and think like, what is going on when we're talking about this? What are we really asking? Are we asking, is the United States a good country? Are we asking, was grandpa a war criminal? Are we asking, uh, uh, you know, what? You know, did, did scientists lead us astray just the way they are now with AI? I don't know, whatever it is, but we're usually asking a different question than the one we appear to be asking. Thank you. And Ms. Kelly. I want to say, since I spent so many hours with Manhattan Project veterans working to try to save their history and take their oral histories, and I must say that. Um, they were driven by a deep-seated patriotism and belief that Germany was ahead of us. Everyone knew Werner Heisenberg. I mean, it was a classmate of Oppenheimer. <laughs> he had already won a Nobel Prize. He, the, the, the Germans had a brilliant team. They're the ones who, who ferreted out uranium as the uh, uh, fissile element that would, would um, work in an atomic chain reaction. Uh, so there was no reason to believe that they wouldn't be well ahead uh, and had a head start. Uh, so that, and, and I think there was another question. Some people say, well, if the United States hadn't uh, gone ahead with this Manhattan Project, then there wouldn't be an atomic bomb. Well, that's not true either. Every industrial country at the beginning of 1939 was working on it. The French had a program, the British had a program, the Italian had a program. The Germans had a program, even the Japanese had a program, the Russians had a program. Everybody was scrambling to figure out how to make this. What the tall pole in the tents and the tent of making an atomic bomb is, is producing the enriched material, uh, the special nuclear material, either plutonium or, uh, or um, enriched uranium. At least those are two varieties that work. And th those are very difficult and require the industrial uh, capacities that uh, we put to work. And I guess it, but my last point about all this is we always call about it as a US program. I just did myself, but it really was an Anglo-American program. We could not have done it without the British. And the British, in fact, were, um, they had opened their borders to the Nazi science, uh, the scientists who were living in Germany and Poland and Italy and other places that were under the Nazi regimes, and they had taken them in, um, and m much of their talent, the so-called British mission, the scientists that that participated in the Manhattan Project, physically located in in uh, Los Alamos, were like half of them were were refugees, and we were so lucky that Hitler was, was uh, as, as racist as he was, as prejudiced against um, uh, Jewish people that he expelled them all and pro prohibited them from, from uh, working in universities. And that was you know, before the <laughs> concentration camps, but they came soon after. Um, so it was greatly to our benefit um, that, we, that we weren't welcoming. And that's what made the huge difference. Anyway, so <laughs> diversity, <laughs> integration, talent, collaboration. I mean, these are really important lessons. Um, I guess what, one more thing, since we talked about MIT and I interviewed David Kaiser, there's a nice interview with him online as well. He, he said that Susan Hockfield, who was the president of MIT, she liked to point out that America's innovation system was begun with the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project provided the blueprint for this and it galvanized American science and technology for the next half century, if not, I might say 80 years. So it has a big, has a long shadow and a very positive, um, positive one, if you look at it that way. All right, thank you both. So let's see, I'm going to do some close up stuff. So first to uh, the audience, 
a reminder, if you have leftover questions, send them to me, randall at nas.org, delighted to forward your questions on to our panelists so that they can have the opportunity to respond. Also a reminder, again, if you want to listen to this again and tell your friends about this and your enemies, uh, you know, this will be on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel within 24 hours in perpetuity as part of our American Innovations webinar series. I will also advertise we are continuing this series, um, you know, this and our you know, other webinars that we do. So please continue to uh, take a look and see later ones of ours. I believe that our next one is going to be on ENIAC on October 3rd, um, for, if, for those of you keeping count. Um, and oh gosh, I don't immediately see one following that, but I'm sure we do. But the point is, come back for more. Uh, if you like this and if you like what we're doing, uh, we encourage you to become members of the National Association of Scholars and support this and other fine things that we do. Um, plug. Uh, and having said all that, um, thank yous. Thank you to our panelists very much. Wonderful webinar. And thank you to our audience. We do this for you. You make this possible by means of your questions. And you, you make it possible by means of your interest. So thank you to all, everybody watching, everybody participating, very grateful. And it's now 3.35, so I'm going to let our poor panelists go now. <laughs>